Okay, so this is the last talk of today by Emmanuel Brula. You can see his title on the screen, Equidistribution of Unipotent Random Walks on Homogeneous Spaces and Local Limit Theorems. Okay. Okay, uh, thank you very much for, for the introduction. Can you hear me well? Hello? Yes, sir. Yes, you can. Okay, good. Um, thanks very much. Can you hear me? So, yes, I can hear you. So I think, I think we can start. Yeah. Uh, please let me know if, if it's difficult for you on your side to, to hear me. Um, yes, so thanks for, um, for this invitation. Um, I'm delighted to be able to speak um, at this conference uh, in honor of, of Danny. Um, so I will uh, speak about um, equidistribution of unipotent random walks and homogeneous spaces and uh, local limit theorems. So this is joint work with Timothée Benard. Um, and um, I will start now. Here's the plan of my talk. So you, you can find the, the, the slides of my talk on, in the chat. Um, I will, I, will, um, I will go through them. So the, 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 the plan of the talk is to uh, first discuss a bit about the so-called Choquet-Denis property of Nilpotin groups. Um, and then I will discuss um, uh, Ratner's theorem and the Benoit-Cain equidistribution theorem. Um, then we'll move on to random ergodic theorems and so-called Ratner, random Ratner theorem. And I will explain how this uh, random, uh, the, the, this uh, equidistribution theorems um, for random walks is related to the notion of local limit theorem. And the, the main result in this talk is, is a joint work with Timote Benard, where we um, uh, establish a local limit theorem, a very general local limit theorem on arbitrary uh, nilpotent Lie groups. So uh, let me start with the Choquet-Denny property. So the Choquet-Denny property is a property that was introduced in the 1960s and, and um, about um, um, abelian groups uh, and uh, the determination of um, harmonic functions on um, abelian groups. So suppose you have a probability measure mu on a group G um, and you suppose the group G is abelian and locally compact and assume also that the support of the measure generates uh, a dense subgroup in G. Then um, Schlocke-Denny in, in 1960 proved that um, the mu harmonic functions are constant. Uh, so this means that mu harmonic means uh, that you have this equation here on the left that mu star F is equal to F. So this, the star here is for the convolution product. So this means that it's the average with respect to the probability measure mu of the translates of f. So if this average is equal to f, you say that the measure is mu harmonic. So this, this is um, basically saying that the value of the function at a given point is equal to the, va to the average values of the translate, of the, value of, the, of the values of the function at the translate of this point by a random element chosen according to the measure mu. So these are called mu harmonic functions, and um, the Schoke-Denny proved that bounded mu harmonic functions are constant on abelian groups. So this is very much a feature of um, uh, abelian or um, let's say nilpotent groups, uh, but very this is not at all the case for more non-commutative groups such as such as semi-simple D groups. So uh, Furstenberg and Dinky Malyutov in the 60s proved the same result for discrete nilpotent groups. And uh, very recently, um, Frisch, Hartmann, Tammuz, and Bahidi uh, showed a beautiful theorem that um, characterizes uh, the finitely generated groups with the Choquet-Denis property. In fact, it's a characterization of nilpotent by finite groups. Um, back in the days, um, Furstenberg, when, when the Choquet-Denis uh, theorem was proven, Furstenberg asked the question whether this holds for an arbitrary nilpotent locally compact group. 
And as, as far as I know, this is still an open problem. However, it was proved by Givash that uh, this holds in the case when the measure mu has some mild moment condition, so that the, uh, the, the moment is finite, some, some, some moment is finite. Okay. Um, so the, the uh, we will see later in, in, in the talk, uh, we'll discuss a local limit theorem and the, the one of the applications of this local limit theorem will be another proof of the Schoke-Denis property, um, but we still need a moment. So, so um, for, for, for Neapolitan Lee groups. Um, so let me move on to the second part. So, so, so the, this is about the uh, Ragunat and Dani conjectures and, and the, uh, which were proven in a celebrated paper by Ratner in, in the series of papers um, in the 90s. So, so here we are in the familiar setting where we have a connected Lie group, a lattice, uh, namely a discrete subgroup of finite covolume. Um, and we pick a point on this on G mod gamma. Um, and, um, and Ratner's theorem says that, sorry, Ratner's theorem says that um, the, um, the uh, topological closure of the orbits uh, of, of a unipotent orbit is equal to the orbit of a larger group, a closed orbit of a larger group, which is itself a finite volume with respect to the um, invariant measure uh, coming from this larger group. And, and besides, all UR ergodic measures are of this form. Okay, so this is a very beautiful um, uh, theorem because it classifies the uh, ergodic invariant measures. And it also says a lot of information about the topological closures of orbits. And this is proven by, um, I mean, the, the, the way this is proved is, is by first establishing a, an equidistribution theorem. Namely, that if you look at the Birkhoff averages uh, of a function along a unipotent flow. So here I have a one parameter flow. Then this will converge to the limiting measure, weakly converge to the li limiting measure uh, on the uh, on hx. So um, so uh, yeah, and 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 the third point is that the the mu stationary measures become invariant. Okay, so the stationary measures are the measures that uh, satisfy the convolution equation mu star nu equals nu. And they, be, they become invariant because just because of the choquet denis property, uh, because we are in an abelian group here. So the, the choquet denis pro or Neapolitan group, uh, depending, and the choquet denis property will tell, tell you that um, any uh, function phi, as at the, in the bottom of the slide, constructed out of uh, a Mm, mu harmonic function uh, uh, constructed out of stationary measure nu will be mu harmonic and therefore constant and therefore uh, invariant. So, um, yeah. Okay, so I should say that um, the, the, this theorem was, uh, of course, conjectured, as you know, by, by Ragunata and Dani. And um, yeah, and, and, and this you see that in this equidistribution statement number two here, the fact that it equidistributes uh, contains um, further information, it contains the fact that the measure, in particular, the measure does not escape, has no escape of mass. And this was uh, proven by uh, Margulis and Dani uh, earlier. Okay. Um, so uh, much later on in, the, in the 2008, um, Benoit and Quint, uh, proved an analog of this theorem where you, instead of looking at a unipotent flow, you uh, look at a, the action of a subgroup, which is Zariski dense. Um, let's say a subgroup whose Zariski closure is semi-simple. So if you start with a semi-simple group, then you can say you start with, a, you, you take lambda to be a Zariski dense subgroup. And, and then you have a similar theorem in the sense that the, the orbits of the Zariski dense subgroup, the closure of the orbits, are homogeneous, they, they, they are themselves a finite volume um, with respect to a Haar measure on the closure uh, on, the, on, on this H. And, and you have, again, another uh, similar uh, 
theorem that the invariant measures are all of this form. And besides, you have a, an equidistribution statement, which takes the form, um, a similar form. So you average this time over the random walk averages instead of just Birkhoff averages. You, you look at the random walk given by, by mu. Mu is a probability measure on uh, your um, on your group lambda. Uh, and this group lambda can be discrete in this case. And, and you take the average, uh, the Cesaro averages of, of the Cesaro, Cesaro average of the random walk. And this will converge to um, the limiting uh, measure on the closure of the orbit. And similarly, you have a third statement that mu stationary measures are invariant under the, under the group. So uh, whenever you are in this situation um, where stationary measures are invariant, uh, we say that the action is stiff. This is terminology introduced by first number. Um, okay, so so this is a kind of uh, so so what's interesting in this theorem is is that the the techniques to prove it, which are inspired by the um, by Ratner's proof, uh, involve um, random walks in a crucial way. Um, so. So here in the in the second part, part you see that the convergence is for Cesaro averages, um, and yeah. So I will discuss this in a second, um, but yeah. Um, but before that, I, I, I I'll tell you about the um, uh, yeah about this fact that um, maybe before Ratner's theorem, uh, you have Birkhoff's theorem, right? So um, you have that um, almost every orbit is equidistributed. So Ratner's theorem is, tells you uh, something about the behavior of an arbitrary orbit. Um, of course, it's much easier to, uh, to know the behavior of an almost every orbit. So that's basically what's given by a godicity uh, of, um, of the measure. If you have an ergodic measure, then Birkhoff ergodic theorem tells you that almost every orbit behaves generically. Um, and I want to point out that um, maybe that's less well known than the Birkhoff ergodic theorem, but there are random ergodic theorems, and maybe the most well known is Kakutani's random ergodic theorem. Uh, which says the same same sort of uh, statement, but uh, instead of uh, again looking at the average of powers of a given transformation, uh, measure preserving transformation, you look at the random walk average. Um, uh, you know, a random walk average given by a certain probability measure on the, on the group G, and looking at the random walk on it. Then you look at this average uh, here, this Cesaro average, one over n sum of mu to the k delta x. Uh, this tends to the, the measure, the invariant measure um, m. So, um, so this is the Kakutani's random ergodic theorem, which was proven in, in 1950, and um, but had been actually announced by uh, von Neumann and Ulam in the already in the 40s. Um, and another not so well-known theorem is a, is a comes from the thesis of Oseledes uh, in 1964, where he showed that if if mu is symmetric, if you have a symmetric measure, um, then you do not need to look at Cesaro averages to to get a random ergodic theorem. You already have the convergence of the um, the of the, the convolution powers of mu, it's themselves, they converge towards the, um, towards the um, uh, ergodic uh, measure M. So that's very general, okay? Whenever you have a group acting on the space uh, by um, uh, me measure preserving um, uh, transformations. So, um, yeah. So the, the 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 so the Benoit theorem is essentially the same thing, but it tells you the same thing in the setting of homogeneous space of a Lie group, uh, and 
the main difference is, is that it tells you uh, the same conclusion, but for an arbitrary um, ergodic measure and for an arbitrary point. Okay, so, uh, so I should say, and this is what I wanted to say just before, that the very recently my co-author uh, Timothée Benard has uh, improved the uh, Benoit Quint theorem by um, removing the the Chisau average here in point two and um, uh, getting a the uh, the convergence of the convolution powers themselves. Okay, so so this this is uh, was for some reason. Um, a question which was left open after the Benoit Kahn uh, work for, for quite a while. And, and, but, but the proof is, is not very difficult, but it's based on a, a forgotten paper of Fogel from the 19, 19, from 75, which shows that the very general fact that if you have an arbitrary probability measure on a group, uh, mu, um, then the difference mu to the n plus one minus mu to the n converges to zero in, in total variation provided the measure uh, gives positive mass to the identity. Okay, so we have a pretty um, fairly good understanding of what is happening to uh, random walk averages uh, along orbits of subgroups that have semi-simple Zariski closure on homogeneous spaces. Okay, so this is what the Benoit Quint and Benard theorems tell you. Emmanuel, so I have a question. Yes. yes. Um, thank you. Uh, could you tell us a little bit about what the significance of the mass at one is and, and what could be saved if that condition doesn't hold? Uh, yes. So um, I would come back to this um, later, but if, if this uh, doesn't hold, then, then you may have a drift, and your random walk may somehow um, it may not equidistribute. So it may keep going and uh, maybe escape to infinity or um, do something like that. So, so then you 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 may not have this um, this um, this condition. There is a slightly um, weaker condition that's that's uh, that's sufficient. It's it's to say that some that maybe mu to the n and mu to the n plus one for some n are not um, um, mutually uh, singular. And that's enough. Okay, so yeah, I'll, I'll move on to, to a statement which I call the random Ratner's theorem. So um, uh, Danny, and uh, so, sorry, Ratner proved, proved her equidistribution theorem. And she asked the question whether the equidistribution theorem, which was for unipotent uh, one dimensional flows, could be generalized to high dimension. And this was done by Nimish Shah in the 1990s. And he showed that you have a very similar theorem uh, when you look at a unipotent subgroup. And you look at the action of unipotent subgroup on G mod gamma, and you obtain a similar theorem where you take the average on a box. So the, the box, in the, you look at the unipotent group and you look at um, maybe the Lie algebra, and on the Lie algebra, you take coordinates, and then you can define a box, um, uh, product of intervals. And if you do the average over this box and, and, and the size of the box is uh, 10 to infinity, then you have a similar convergence. Okay, so that's, that's very satisfying, very general. Um, so here is the, the statement of um, our, one of our main theorems. So um, I'm, I mean, I'm in the setting of the ratner shah theorem, so G mod gamma, and I have action of a unipotent group, um, which may not be one dimensional, arbitrary dimension, any uh, connected unipotent group. And then I look at the uh, Chisarro averages of the random walk on, uh, acting on, on the orbit of an arbitrary point X. 
Okay, and and then I, I claim that um, we we have uh, the convergence of Cesaro averages towards the limiting measure, the Ratner's limiting measure on the closure of the orbit of X under the group U. And furthermore, and th that's very general. So the only assumption we need is is that the the me measure mu be aperiodic. So this means that it's not um, it, the support is not contained in a proper subgroup. Um, sorry, is not contained in a coset of a proper subgroup. That's what a periodic means. And that's a necessary assumption. And on the other hand, if you assume that the measure is centered, so in particular symmetric, for example, but centered means that the, the, the mean on the abelianization of U is zero, then we even have convergence of the convolution pairs. So, um, so this this theorem is uh, something that I um, I had studied in in my PhD thesis uh, years ago, and at the time I had um, proven a similar result with where, where mu was symmetric and finitely supported, and and the way I had proven this was um, by exploiting both Schaas theorem and some local limit theorems due to Alexopoulos and Varopoulos on discrete nilpotent groups, um, along with uh, some results from Givarch's thesis. So now we have a very general theorem that uh, extends uh, um, uh, what I did in my thesis to arbitrary measures that may not be finitely supported, and more importantly, that may not be um, symmetric. Okay, so the measure mu here can have a drift. And when there is a drift, then the behavior of the random walk is, is much more complicated. So I'll explain this uh, in the second part of the talk. Um, okay, so, so here I want to give a, a, an example um, of what can happen if the if you're not centered, uh, if you so the, the 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 assumptions here are somehow necessary. So if you're not centered, then you will may not have the second condition here, uh, the, the second conclusion that mu to the n star delta x tends to m x, and if you're not um, aperiodic, you may not have the first conclusion either. So, so here's an example in uh, SL2R mod SL2Z uh, that shows that you, um, that non-centered aperiodic walks can very well have a full escape of mass at infinity. So this um, uh, maybe gives another answer to, to, to your question, Jens. Uh, so you, you, you start with a, a, a point, one, zero, theta, one, uh, Z2, so that's a certain uh, lattice in, in R2, and you look at the um, unipotent, the standard unipotent group, 1T01. Okay, well, then it turns out that if you your measure mu is not centered, let's say it's it's average, so it's a measure on this one, one parameter group, if the measure has uh, mean 1, then there will be a subsequence along which the, the full, all, almost all of the random walk will live very far into the cusp. Okay, and um, yeah, so, so this has to do with, uh, if you, you have to choose your theta uh, in, so that it satisfies a Diffontine property, which is satisfied for almost all uh, thetas, namely that you can find arbitrarily large n and m such that n times n theta plus m is, it can be very small. Uh, and then basically what, what's happening is, is, is that the, when, the, the, when you get close to the cusp, then because the, the random walk behaves like, um, is basically, uh, after, if you have drift n, uh, drift one, then after time n, you're roughly in a window around the point n of size roughly square root of n plus minus with you know you have perturbation you know the central limit theorem tell, gives you that the random walk lives in some interval of size roughly square root of n 
around n, well, this square root of n is not enough to be able to go back to a compact set uh, in, the, uh, in, in the homogeneous space. Uh, as we know that the we, we know that by the homecoming of unipotent trajectories, we know that the trajectories come back near in a compact set uh, eventually. But here, because of the square root of n is too is not is too small, so it will stay in the cusp for 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 all this time. Okay, so this shows that you you cannot expect to have a convergence for um, random walk average averages without the Cesaro average, if your measure is not centered. Okay. All right, so let me remind you some classical things now. So now I will move on to, um, um, to the, um, the, the core of, um, the, the, of, of the engine that allows us to, 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 to prove this equidistribution. And that's a local limit theorem uh, on, on, the, on an arbitrary nilpotent groups for essentially an arbitrary measure uh, with some conditions some of moments, but that's about it. Um, so, so before I get there, I just want to, to remind you uh, what is a local limit theorem. Uh, uh, and I'll start with a classical case where you, you're just on the real line. And you have a sequence of real valued random variables with a common law mu, let's say g1, gn. And you, let, you look at the sum of these random variables, g1 plus gn. So, so this is the fam familiar setting of uh, sums of independent um, random variables, real value random variables. And in that setting, you have the well-known uh, central limit theorem, namely that there are variations around the mean. The mean is n times m. And, and, and the variations are of size square root of n. And you have um, a uh, Gaussian limiting measure when you renormalize by square root of n. And this Gaussian has a mean, has a standard deviation, which is given by the second moment of uh, the original measure. So that's the central limit theorem. So, um, of course, when you have a central limit theorem, you also have quantitative central limit theorems, namely Berry SN bounds that uh, quantify the error uh, of approximation. But you have also something more subtle, which is called the local limit theorem and controls um, the behavior of the random walk before it is renormalized by square root of n. So, you don't renormalize, but you want to understand. The, the measure of uh, the probability that your random walk uh, lives in some given uh, interval, let's say a b uh, fixed interval. And you want to say that this 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 probability is quite close to the corresponding probability if you had replaced the um, the, the random variables by the corresponding Gaussian random variables. So this new n here is the Gaussian law which you obtain by replacing uh, uh, mu by a Gaussian distribution with the same mean and the same um, L2, the same moment of order two. Okay, and so the upshot is that the probability that the random walk lies in some interval, fixed interval, is proportional to the size of the interval divided by square root of n. Okay, um, yeah, so, so of course, this limit theorem, as I say here in this, on the slide, is, is um, goes back to uh, you know the, the cradle of uh, probability theory in eighteenth century, where Bernoulli random variables. But uh, for an arbitrary measure like this, you know, aperiodic uh, and centered measure on R, uh, this was first shown quite recently in the sixties by Charles Stone. The, the there is of course the proof is by Fourier theory, Fourier analysis. But there is a uh, fairly subtle uh, analytical point that uh, technical point that needs to be um, that, that needs to be addressed, and this was addressed only in the 60s uh, when you want to deal with an arbitrary measure of with a moment of order two and aperiodic. Okay, so. Um, so the goal will be to, to prove a similar theorem in an arbitrary nilpotent groups. Um, so 
the, before I get there, I want to, to say how, um, in, in what way this can be used to establish the uh, equidistribution theorem on unipotent uh, random walks on homogeneous spaces. So, um, so this the, the 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 link between the equidistribution on homogeneous spaces and the equidistribution and, and the local limit theorem is provided by by this this, this corollary here. So the, the the fact that we have a local limit theorem, which uh, as you see on the previous slide, is very uniform. So you have here a, a uniformity in, in T. So that's very uniform uh, because you look at it, the approximation is, is uniform when you translate your interval by arbitrary translation. And this has the following consequence. So suppose you have a bounded function, which is continuous on, on the real line. And, and assume that, so you, so you don't assume any decay of the function. It's maybe it may have bumps, it may be, but just it's bounded and continuous. And you assume that its averages on, on uh, the interval zero t uh, converge as t tends to infinity. Well, then the conclusion is that if you take an arbitrary uh, random walks like sum of independent random variables with the same assumptions like um, uh, as before, uh, so with um, a moment of order two, then the, the expectation of f of Sn tends to the same limit. Okay, and the, the point is, is that because you understand very well uh, the approximation um, of your random walk in any given interval, then you will be able to replace the random walk by the corresponding Gaussian. And then the Gaussian is smooth, so you can basically approximate the Gaussian by uh, averages on, on, on small intervals and, 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 and get, get the answer here. So why, why is this uh, relevant to the distribution on, on, on homogeneous spaces? Well, the reason is that when you look at an orbit, let's say, of a one-parameter flow on a homogeneous space, um, you want to show that the, um, you know, the average uh, uh, yeah, the average of the random walk uh, tends to the integral of your function. So the, the sum of, yeah, the average of the, your function with respect to, to the random walk tends to the average of your function with respect to the Haar measure. Uh, but you see, you can see your, your function lives, your random walk lives on an orbit. And, and this orbit uh, wraps around the homogeneous space and the value of the function f on the orbit now becomes, so it becomes a function on the real line that has bumps, but does not tend to zero. And so you are exactly in the situation of this corollary where, you know, you lift the function to, to the real line. And the only thing you know that, it, that it's become equidistributed in that sense. And you conclude from the corollary that you have the co-distribution of the random walk. So in a way, the local limit theorem is the bridge that allows you to translate any, um, uh, any equidistribution statement uh, for Lebesgue measure or for Howe measure uh, to an equidistribution statement for uh, random walks. Okay, right. So, um, so now I will... Um, I will uh, tell you about uh, an example of a random walk of what of a limit theorem for random walks on a nilpotent group. So the the the, the first and um, interesting example of a nilpotent uh, Lie group, uh, non-abelian, is is the Heisenberg group. So that's upper triangular matrices um, with um, uh, one on the diagonal and three by three matrices. Uh, so, so on, on this group, you have a, a, a family, a one-parameter family of automorphisms, uh, which are called dilation automorphisms, which correspond to uh, multiplying x and y by t and z by t squared. So it's like a homothety, but it's not homogeneous. There is uh, the, the first x and y are multiplied by t, and the second 
layer is multiplied by t squared. But it's it's a one parameter group of automorphisms. So so these these automorphisms they they sort of um, uh, will replace the homo the the rescaling. So we will do the rescaling using those automorphisms because they capture the large scale geometry of of these uh, Milpotent groups. So um, and indeed the central limit theorem on the Heisenberg group was first proved by Tutu Balin uh, in, in Russia in the 60s. And he showed that if you have a, a probability measure with finite second moment on U, with, which is centered. So centered means that if you project to the abelianization, namely X and Y, then you get a centered measure. So the average is zero. So if you, if you start with this, then, uh, and you take convolution powers of your measure, which is the same thing as looking at a uh, random walk on the Heisenberg group with independent um, increments, and like random walk of two tie n, you renormalize by these dilations, uh, like d of one of a square root of n, and the conclusion is that you converge to a certain measure. So th this measure is the analog of the Gaussian measure. Okay. Um, but it's not a Gaussian in the usual sense. Okay, it's a certain measure, which is very nice in many ways, uh, but, but, it, but it's not a, a, an ordinary Gaussian. Okay, so, so this was proven by Tutu Balin. Um, it also uh, realized that, that it was, um, in fact, proven in fact, earlier by then in, the, in 1959, who was a student of Kakutani at Yale back in the days. So, um, um, now let me tell you a few things about the limiting measure. So the limiting measure is, is not a, a Gaussian. However, it's, it satisfies a similar uh, differential equation. So it belongs to a one parameter semi-group of probability measures, um, uh, in nu sub t. And these probability measures uh, have a smooth density on the Heisenberg group on, on x, y, z. And these, these smooth densities satisfy uh, have a hypoelliptic PDE. So namely, they satisfy the following, uh, d over dt equals one half x squared plus y squared u, where x and y are the um, uh, vector fields uh, of translations by x and by y. So, so here it's called hypoelliptic because you don't have a z, you don't have z squared. And, and that's the main difference with the Gaussian the ordinary Gaussian on the Euclidean uh, space. So um, there is a interesting um, probabilistic interpretation of this, um, of this Gaussian limiting law, um, which is given in terms of what's called the Levy area of the Brownian motion. So imagine that you have a Brownian motion on R2, so on X, uh, XY, and, and uh, and you look at the um, uh, you look at the, so that this the, the the black here black path is is the point in motion, and you look at the signed area between the path and the chord, connecting the the, the 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 origin to the point you you end up at. And and this 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 is called the Levy area. And um, uh, and the, the distribution um, uh, of, of the, the, the central component of this limiting measure uh, gotten from the central limit theorem is, has, is exactly the, the, the Levy area of uh, the corresponding body in motion on the other bottom. Because if you project on x, x comma y, then the, the random walk Converges to a Ga to an ordinary Gaussian, to ordinary Gaussian, so it converges to a Brownian motion. But the z part uh, is what's interesting, and the, z the, the 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 distribution of the z part is exactly the distribution of this Levy area. And you can it's so it's hard to put to give a precise formula for the uh, for the density of this measure, but you can give a formula for the Fourier transform, and this is what I've written here on the on the um, uh, on the slide, and it was computed, in fact, by Levy in, in the in the fifties. 
Okay, so um, so the proofs of the central limit theorem, where you renormalize by these dilations, uh, I mean, are based on um, semigroup theory usually, and um, and a convergence of of uh, sequences of semigroups of operators. On the other hand, proving a local limit theorem has has been much harder. So in, in the 90s, Varopoulos and Alexopoulos have developed a, a, a theory that allows to prove local limit theorems on nilpotent groups, a, a very rich and very interesting uh, theory, which um, does somehow is, does not use any of uh, the previous techniques, um, but they, uh, their techniques need an assumption on the measure. They need that the measure be absolutely continuous with respect to a Haar measure, basically. So, um, so in my thesis, uh, almost 20 years ago now, um, I proved a local limit theorem um, without uh, any assumption of absolute continuity on, of the measure mu, so for an arbitrary measure mu. Um, and so, the theorem is, is as follows. So if you have a, a periodic measure on the Heisenberg group, um, and I had to assume that it's compactly supported, centered, and, uh, and centered, so you can always normalize. That's not an assumption. Then you have the, the, the conclusion that the uh, local limit theorem holds, namely the probability that you land in a fixed box converges to the corresponding probability for the limiting measure, the renormalized limiting measure. So this new n here is new uh, composed with the dilation, which is the same thing as the convolution power of new uh, up to the power n, because new is a one parameter group of probability measures. So, so it's the exact analog of this local limit theorem on the real line, but on the Heisenberg group. And what's interesting to, 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 to note here is that the, the the probability that you land in a given box decays like one over n squared, even though we are in three dimensions. So over R three, you would get one over n square root of n, but here you get one over n squared, and that has to do with the fact that we are in a Heisenberg group and we it's a non-commutative space. So the renormalization is is uh, is, is smaller somehow. Okay, so um, yeah, so so here is um, here at the bottom of the slide the the um, one of uh, our main results with with uh, Timothée Benard. We managed to extend um, this uh, this theorem to uh, that's on the Heisenberg group, but we uh, we actually prove it in very much more generally for an arbitrary Neapolitan group. But I just stated here for the Heisenberg group, uh, we prove it for um, non-centered random walks. So if your random walk is non-centered, then surprisingly there is a, a an, eff an, an effect. It has a very serious effect on the way uh, the, the local limit theorem has to be formulated, and also the central limit theorem. Uh, namely, you will see that here at the bottom right, you see that the, the probability that so first of all there, there is a drift so there is x capital x here is is the drift so that's the 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 average of mu in the abelianization so this means that the, the random walk will move in the abelianization and while you know in in the case of an, an abelian group this is very mild because we can always renormal we can really we shift back at the identity by just taking negative nx and because everything is commutative, this has no influence. But here in the, in the non-commutative context, this has a tremendous influence. You cannot just shift back. So, and indeed, you we see that the probability that you, uh, that the, the walk ends in B e to the nx behaves like, uh, so again, the big measure of B divided by n to the power five over two, which is different from, Two, it's small. It's you know it's smaller. So the drift has an effect of um, 
spreading out the, the random walk more than without, without drift. So it decays at a, at a, it decays faster somehow. But you have a, we managed to establish this similar theorem, namely that the, the um, probability that the random walk ends at, in a given box uh, is uh, comparable to the probability um, of the corresponding uh, limiting measure um, that it lands on this box. And what's also interesting here is to note that uh, in the case when you have a drift, the limiting measure, so in the central limit theorem, is Gaussian. It's a real Gaussian. It's not this Levy area that I described be before. Okay, so when you have a drift, then you really get a Gaussian, but you have to be careful. You need to renormalize not by this automorphism, this one parameter group of automorphism, T, T, T squared, but by another one, which is TTT cube. Okay. So, um, yeah. So there is a, a the, the 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 reason is that the the run the 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 drift spreads out the random walk much more in the space. Okay. So that's what happens in the Heisenberg group. Yeah. So that's what I say on this slide that it sort of flattens the walk. And so here is a picture. Um, showing on the left the centered case. So basically, this what, what I show in this picture is is basically the the where the the, the run walk lives at time t. So on the on the Heisenberg group in the x y z coordinates. So basically, the the, the geo large scale geometry of the Heisenberg group um, in the centered case, yeah. the run walk lives on some kind of apple like this, where of square square root of t. Uh, radius in the base and t height while on the other hand when you have a drift and you uh, take it you shift it back to to the origin um, then the the behavior is large scale behavior is very different it looks like an ellipsoid uh, of size t of height t square root of t and again of base uh, of radius square root of t so these are the two very different behaviors you get in the centered and the non-centered case Okay, so um, I need to hurry up a bit and then I'll, I'll skip um, this uh, about the, the proof. So the proofs of the local limit theorem uh, in my thesis was, was based on Fourier analysis and also on the spectral gap estimate um, using unitary, infinite dimensional unitary representations of the, um, of the Heisenberg group. But for some reason, uh, this, this, I mean, the, this, the fact that I was using these um, um, unitary representations um, made it very difficult to, to extend the theorem um, to the method of proof to higher dimensional um, nilpotent groups. And recently, a, bit, a few years ago, uh, Diakonis and Hoff came up with a very different proof of my theorem which was based not on um, unitary representations, but on a new uh, combinatorial trick, which um, I call the path, path swap. So I'll say something about this in a second. And it turned out that this idea was quite versatile and it allowed uh, first Hoff to generalize the local limit theorem to uh, an arbitrary centered um, measures on arbitrary leak group, uh, Nilpotent leak group. And it allows us now to establish the central limit theorem and the local limit theorem um, for arbitrary non centered uh, um, random walks on an arbitrary Nilpotent leak group. Okay, so um, the whole proof is done by Fourier analysis on the Lie algebra. And I'll say one thing about the pass swap idea. So the 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 Diakonis pass swap idea is, is um, okay. It's hard to to swallow in one slide, but maybe I'll I'll I'll, I'll say um, in in a couple words what what this idea is about. the The idea is is that um, you can exploit a factorization of the of the um, um, characteristic function of 
the of the z part um, by exploiting the fact that you have a sum or sort of product of independent random variables and therefore you can perform um, you can perform permutations of any variable any permutation of the variable does not change the law of the product of course because there are independent random variables however if you perform um, 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 cleverly choice uh, uh, so cleverly chosen uh, swaps between um, intervals of uh, of the variables uh, then they show that you can get an extra smoothing in the central variable in the z variable and this is obtained um, by Going this factorization, which I show at the bottom here, factorization of the um, um, characteristic function of this random variable, which is the central part. And, and this is the, somehow the key that somehow replaces the spectral gap that I had in my thesis. And, and, and it's surprisingly uh, versatile and effective. And this can be used uh, in general for an arbitrary, uh, an arbitrary dimension. Okay, so the, the implementation of this, this idea in, in general is quite uh, um, notationally heavy, so I probably skip this a bit. Um, I just want to, I'm running out, out of time, so I just want to state, to, yeah, to, to give the, the statement of the theorem first of the CLT here. So the CLT will be similar, but I want to stress that the, um, dilation structure uh, depends now on the drift and there is as in the heisenberg group case it spreads out the, the, the measure much more and so the the the, um, the dimension the homogeneous dimension uh, that we we that the random walk uh, sees is is higher than the homogeneous dimension of the Lie group so the homogeneous C dimension here is d mu, is this sum of i dim mi, um, which in the Heisenberg group case, d mu is five, right? In the non-centered case, while in the centered case, d mu is four, and that corresponds to the ordinary large scale homogeneous dimension of the whole Heisenberg group. Okay, so I want to stress that, yeah, if you have a drift, then you have a higher dimension. Okay, but not only that, but the limiting measure that you obtain at the end, which again satisfies the hyperelliptic uh, time-dependent PDE, now it's time-dependent. Uh, this this um, this limiting measure by Hormander theorem we know is has a density, a smooth density. However, it does not always have full support, and that's a very different, very very um, different. Uh, uh, phenomenon that does not arise in the centered case. So there are certain regions in in the Lie group that are, cannot be attained by the um, limiting process. So they somehow the limiting measure lies on a, a, sub, a subset of U. So yeah, so that, that that's something that we hadn't realized actually at the beginning, and it's only a phenomenon that happens in step three and higher. So it does not happen in the Heisenberg group. Um, but it's certainly there, and 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 so that that's uh, uh, something which is uh, yeah is surprising. Okay, so that they, so yeah, so I'll st end end with the statement of the the theorem. So again, the statement of the theorem is is, is similar; it doesn't change so much. But uh, the, the the statement of the local limit theorem. The, the probability that you land in some fixed box is close to the probability of this limiting measure we normalized by the suitable dilation, which again depends on the drift and and the the the, the rate uh, uh, here of decay depends on this dimension, which again uh, is is larger, it's homogeneous dimension, which depends on the drift and is larger than the one you have without a drift. So to conclude, uh, I should say that the the uh, this concludes somehow the 
it's essentially the, the best theorem you, you can hope for um, for random walks on an arbitrary nilpotent leak group. And we also obtain a Berriestan estimate, a quantitative uh, central limit theorem. And, and using this, we, uh, as, as I mentioned before, we obtain the applications to equidistribution of random walks on homogeneous spaces, as well as a new proof of the Choquet-Denis property for nilpotent leak groups. So I uh, thank you for your attention. Uh, stop here. Okay, I have a question. So, how so the measure is supported on the unipotent on a unipotent uh, group? But how important is it? Uh, uh, it's absolutely essential. So, um, uh, if your if your measure is not supported on a unipotent group, then um, supported on something else, and the Zariski closure of this something else has a completely different um, behavior. So. Um, yeah, so so it's it's a bit like asking what's the difference between Ratner's theorem and Benoit Quint theorem. Uh, they are similar theorems, but they are very different in their setting, um, right? So here I use only the Ratner theorem. I don't use the you know, it's not Benoit Quint, it's just Ratner. So it's about unipotent flows. I'm not trying to I, I answer your question, but. Um, yeah, so so if you take an arbiter, if you take something else which is not unipotent, then you're going to have very different behavior. So if uh, you, I mean it, you are going to need to prove theorems about random walks, let's say on a SL2R, for example, and that's another that's another completely um, a very different um, set of theorems that uh, actually are still open in in, in general, but. Um, yeah, I think so. So, in particular, uh, this is also true for the um, theorem of Bernard. Uh, or, or was it a, a general theorem about the, the non, the fact that you don't need to take a zero average? Um, yeah. So, so the theorem of Bernard is is uh, is in a sense quite soft. Because it's it's based on this theorem of of uh, Vogel, and and the um, and the Benoit characterization of mu stationary measures. So it does not you don't need um, you yeah you basically need Benoit and this and, and this uh, Vogel mm -hmm. result, but it's you don't need a local limit theorem like we do here. Yeah. Hi, Manuel. Um, to maybe follow up the question of Erez, um, so can you highlight maybe a, a feature of these results that is false uh, when you when you replace uh, an, the nil potency by say a semi simplicity? So what what pro property that you pointed out will be? What phenomena will be will change drastically? Um, yeah, so maybe if I maybe go back um, to the beginning, um, to, to, this, to this statement. So th th this statement is true for an arbitrary uh, measure mu, um, whose Zarsky closure of the support uh, who support generates a, a group that's with semi-simple Zariski closure, right? So, um, so yeah, so that, that that holds. But somehow, for this, you need two things: you need this Fogel result, which is quite soft, but you also need uh, the characterization of mu stationary measures, right? And and somehow in in 
in our theorems, we, we also need uh, the characterization of mu stationary measures, which somehow follows from the shoke denis property. Um, yeah, so I, I would say, I mean, there, there are two different settings, you know, the semi-simple case and the unipotent case. And I don't see an over, overarching principle that would allow you to prove both equidistribution statements somehow at the same time in one stroke. Um, yeah. So I, I guess I either I mis uh, explained the question or you misunderstood me. So um, you told us about several uh, uh, probabilistic uh, theorems, like the uh, local limit theorem that you just ended the talk with, right? Mm -hmm. um, and w my question was, do you expect similar? Okay, so Benoit and Kahn have uh, several, uh, uh, I guess, analogous theorems in, in the semi-simple case, right? Uh, but probably, um, I, I don't remember the, the statements exactly, but uh, I'm guessing that the nil potency is somehow reflected in, in, the, uh, in the statements. Uh, and I, my question was, regarding that so what what in the statements of the strong theorems that you mentioned uh, of uh, of you and bernard uh, where can you see the difference between the uh, nilpotent world and the semi-simple world but maybe there is no difference i don't know maybe there is no i, I wasn't asking about like a unifying uh, argument mm. that takes care of both uh, worlds I understand that the tools are completely different, but uh, is it is the truth also different or just the tools? Um, yeah. So okay, I'm not okay. So um, so the Benoit -Kan theorem is is proven using random walks, right? So it might conceivably be possible that you could prove directly the equidistribution uh, without having to invoke a local limit theorem in the case of unipotent, unipotent walks. Uh, but, but this is not how, yeah, this is just not, um, how we thought about it uh, because I don't know because uh, you know um, first of all the, I think you know the local limit theorem is something deeper which can be applied to this particular situation because we already know the Ratner's theorem so in the semi-simple case there is no there was no Ratner's theorem before Benoit Kant. Right? And there is no way to, you, I mean, maybe you can formulate a kind of a Ratner theorem where instead of um, uh, instead of random walk average, you, you may look at average over balls. And I think people have done that, right? Uh, if I'm not mistaken, but the, where you look at average over balls in, in a semi-simple Lie group, right? Um, actually, I'm, I'm not so sure if this has been done or not, um, but yeah, so um, yeah, so, so the, the way we, we do this is, is by, you know, proving something on the Nippleton Lee group, random walks on Nippleton Lee group, and then that allows us to, to, to um, connect uh, the Ratner theorem to the, um, to the local limit theorem to give to give this equidistribution statement on the homogeneous space, uh, Benoit can do it differently. They work directly on with the random walks on the on the on the homogeneous space. Um, whether you can do this for other groups and the semi-simple groups that Benoit can do that's that's an interesting question. But um, And, and conceivably, it's, it's possible to do that. So it would be nice because we, we would then be able to 
um, to prove a, a theorem of this kind without the assumption that this Isaac closure is semi-simple or unipotent, because at the moment we have this theorem with um, under the assumption the Isaac closure is either semi-simple or unipotent. And of course, you would want to ask uh, whether this holds without either or. But um, that's an open problem, I guess. Any more questions? I have a <laughs> Hello, Emmanuel. This is Riddhi. Uh, Hi, Riddhi. Hi. So I have uh, one comment to make and then a question. So I there is a, a work done by Raja and uh, Zawoski on uh, Chokedoni, Chokedoni theorem on totally disconnected groups with polynomial group, compact eigenmotive ones. It's totally and, disconnected. Okay. Yeah. Yes. And also, if Chokedani holds, then your supporting group must be amenable, right? So that's yeah. maybe the reason why you are working on reputant group. That's right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so apparently, the, the, for nilpotent groups, it's still an open problem in general. Uh, without this moment condition. Uh, this is a, a bit embarrassing, but I, I think that's the case. Um, so that's, yeah. Hello? Uh, so I was yeah. saying, how do these conditions compare with uh, symmetry of a measure or density? Uh, the other ones are much stronger. I mean, I don't see the connection really. So. Uh, say, say that again. The, 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 the center that the measure is centered or aperiodic? Yes. So aperiodic, of course, you don't expect density, but uh, how do they compare with, say, a measure is symmetric? Mm -hmm. um, yes. So um, so on a, on, a, on a unipotent group, like the Heisenberg group, for example, I mean, this being symmetric implies being centered. Um, but you can be centered without being symmetric. I mean, obviously. Um, um, so, um, and uh, aperiodicity is, is 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 basically not an assumption, really. It's more like um, uh, you know, um, um, if you so, it's an assumption that that arises already in the in the case of of the real life. So when you formulate the local limit theorem, then you need a, a periodicity condition. Uh, otherwise, it's just not not true uh, because your your random walk lives on always on a translate of lattice. Otherwise, and so this something similar happens here in a, in a Newton groups. So if you're not aperiodic, then your random walk will always live on on a translate of a certain proper subgroup. So at every every given time. Um, and so that that um, prevents um, the local limit theorem to to hold uh, if you're not a periodic. So it's, so these are necessary conditions. Okay, so probably there are no more questions. So let's thank the speaker once more. Okay, well, thank, thanks for your attention. And sorry for not being able to, to be with, with you today. <laughs>